And uh, then we can maybe have a little uh, question and answer session at the end, uh, yes, uh, whatever we have time for. That would be absolutely wonderful. Okay. Okay, I think we've started live screening, so I can um, I can start the session. Um, it's really good to uh, welcome you all to the uh, the third third section of um, fantasy and puppetry, uh, being beamed out from the uh, from the Center for Fantasy and the Fantastic at the University of Glasgow. Um, for this part of the day, uh, we're joined by the performer, director, scholar, and puppeteer Howard Gayton who's going to be talking to us about bringing fantasy creatures to life in the theater. Um, once again, I'd like to remind you to type your questions into the Q&A uh, and we'll collect them from these sources and try to make sure we ask as many as possible in the time available afterwards. So Howard has, has, uh, has directed and performed multiple puppet shows for the acclaimed Little Angel Theater in London, as well as for Norwich Puppet Theatre, Light Theatre at the Eden Project and other venues. He teaches glove puppets at the Curious School of Puppetry and tours a traditional Punch and Judy show. Howard was the co-founder of Offer Boom, a comedia company which toured across Europe for 20 years. He's now co-director of Columbina, Columbina Theatre with playwright Peter Oswald. I met him recently after he'd completed a 500 mile pilgrimage on foot to the COP26 conference in my hometown, Glasgow. So it's a real privilege to see him again and to welcome him to our screens to talk about bringing life to fantasy creatures in the theater. Thank right. you, Howard. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, I remember the uh, lovely meal we had uh, at Glasgow as well. Still, still very nice. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name's Howard, so I'm gonna to talk today um, so what we've been uh, looking at today is really interesting seeing, hearing about Wendy and Brian, starting with the original Henson puppet works, which was more or less stage puppetry brought onto film, and Brian talking about how, how he had to hide the puppeteer, and then Todd talking more about, well, now the puppets are kind of green screened and you don't have to worry about hiding the puppeteer. Um, and my, what I work in is stage puppetry, and um, that has a lot of links with film puppetry, particularly the older uh, style of uh, film puppetry, but it's also its own thing. Uh, and there are several types of stage puppetry. Uh, shadow is one, which Todd mentioned uh, in his Q&A, that sort of someone doing a shadow of a bird as part of a story. Normally, there's two sort of ways of doing shadow. You always have to have a light source and you're projecting it onto something. And I think shadows are quite, they're quite mystical, they're quite fantastical, this idea of the, the shadow being projected. And often the puppeteer will be behind the screen uh, with the, the light source there and they'll be projecting different things onto the screen with the audience that side. And the closer to the screen the object is, the more defined it is, and the closer to the light source, the more diffuse it is. So. Uh, particularly in, in a lot of Asian countries, there's some wonderful kind of shadow puppetry that's that sort of battles of gods. Uh, you imagine kind of coming in and out of focus and different colors that are used. Um, there are marionette puppets, which are puppets that are on a string, which is where we get that, um, the kind of idea we have, the meme of the puppet of something being puppeteered on a string and, you know, um, I worked at the Little Angel Theatre, which has one of the only uh, string puppet uh, galleries. So the puppeteers are right up about 15 foot above with these long um, strings for the puppets. I've never myself used marionettes because I found the strings are a little bit, I like being close to my puppet. I found that the closer I was, the more I could connect to the puppet, uh, but very good marionette marionettists just bring a puppet alive and uh, what the audience sees on the whole is the puppets and some strings and the uh, beautiful movement. And then there's rod puppets which are kind of tabletop on a table they have rods and you control the puppet with the rods you can have rods on the arms on the heads on the feet which is a kind of Bumraku style which you saw actually in um, one of the images of Todd's with the caterpillars or Rod puppetry. 
And there's Glove, which I'm going to talk about later because that's my kind of speciality. But I thought I'd start this talk looking at objects because um, I've got I'm intrigued by the idea of the the puppets of the mixing with the fantastic and the fantastical. And I think there's something basic about object theatre uh, uh, that that speaks both to puppets and to the the fantastic and to the kind of philosophy behind puppetry. So there's sort of two things with objects. So if you kind of now, wherever you're looking, just look somewhere at an object, any object, a cup or a light or a, a door or a chair. And you can imagine it coming to life and speaking with you. Now, this can be done either through creating a puppet out of that object, as Todd and um, Wendy and Brian were talking about, about actually creating a, a, a puppet, making one, so a puppet chair. That's one way of doing it and having it come alive. But the other way is actually just manipulation of objects, of seeing objects as being potentially alive. And um, for me, there's a sense as a puppeteer that I can imagine that the world is animate that every single object has some life to express, something that it wants to express. Um, and I think that that's quite magical and quite fantastical. And it's a specific way of kind of looking uh, at the world, I think. Um, this kind of animist way of looking at an object and saying, what is that object saying? Can that object actually come alive. I can look at it as a puppet, but I can look at it as an object. And I'm going to um, do a, a little demonstration now of one of the first things that I would do when I would uh, teach puppetry to show you what I mean. There's kind of two little exercises that I'm going to show uh, in, my, in my workshop on a studio here um, in Devon. Uh, I've got some uh, stuff set up, so I'll show you that. This was an exercise. The first exercise was an exercise that was uh, taught to me by a brilliant man called Chris Leaf, who uh, died unfortunately uh, several years ago, who was the artistic director at the Little Angel Theatre in London. If you ever get a chance to go to Little Angel, go to it. It's the most amazing place. It's in Islington. It was built as a puppet theatre 60 years ago from an old temperance hall. It's magical in and of itself. And he his take on puppetry on the first time that you connect to a puppet was very much about the sense of giving life to a puppet that me as a puppeteer i'm giving life to a puppet or an object so i'm just going to switch a uh, camera to uh, over there i think that'll work uh, so what i've got here is um just a very simple piece of cloth um, so something that I would often use to, to kind of start uh, working with puppetry would be just a simple piece of cloth because as actually both Brian and Wendy, despite them making these, these um, and Todd was talking about, despite making things for films, it always starts very simple. And there's something very sim simple about this. So I'm gonna just talk through an exercise that would Normally I'll, I'll take people through maybe 15, 20 minutes, but I'll do it quickly. I'll take probably about three minutes. So let's put a little bit of um, music on. And I'll, uh, where are we? There, let's just play a little bit. So what I would ask the puppeteer to do is to, first of all, to just watch the cloth. So I'm coming into a visual relationship with the cloth to begin with. I'm just looking at it. And then I sink into my breath and I start to breathe. So I'm watching the cloth and I'm breathing with it. And I'm creating a connection between my stomach and the cloth. I'm not touching it yet. But I'm aware that at the point where I touch it, I'm gonna be giving life to it. Is that 
touch the cloth, start to just allow myself to breathe with it. So my breathing, the breathing of the cloth becomes one. I can start to see the eyes of the puppet. I can see where its focus is. And allow it to explore the space. I myself am looking at the back of the puppet and trying to allow it to have its own eyes, its own look. Then allow it to look around, to explore its space. Then come to a point where I want to end the exercise and allow the puppet to find its space to rest. And then there's a very important part of this process, which is the taking away of life from the puppet. So I've given it life, I've given it my breath. And then there's a moment where I'm about to let go and take that life away again. And I find that a very kind of profound uh, moment of this uh, giving life and taking life. That already starts to speak of creator and created and what is life and what is breath. These are the questions I think that this fundamental exercise of puppetry starts to bring up. And what attitude can we have to the puppet? Um, okay, so the next exercise, so we'll move this off. This is again something actually that um, everybody's talking about today, which is the material of the puppet. So one of the other exercises that I'll do is when you're looking at an object, so I've got a stick here, one of the first things you want to do is find out what the stick wants to say. What is stickiness? What is stickness? How does it feel? What does it naturally want to do? Just in my hand, how does it fall? How does it move? What weight does it have? And if I bring it down onto a surface, okay, this one's quite a springy stick, so it has this springiness to it. So I'm listening to the quality of the material to find out how it wants to move rather than myself automatically imposing movement on it. I'm trying to listen to what this object wants to do, how it moves. Now the stick moves in a certain way. It's quite hard. It has a certain weight to it. Seems to like bouncing. But if I look at, different material. So I look at this, just a piece of string, it moves in a very different way. It has a very different weighting. Okay, you can do this, which is quite nice. How does it relate to a surface? What is it wanting to say? How does it want to behave as an object?
Okay. Just move the come back round to uh, by the camera. Yeah. So that's this this um, sort of demonstration of of the first ideas of puppetry and I love those exercises because they really within them there's so much about puppetry there's so much about how we can approach the puppet give it some sacredness give it some just the idea of bringing something to life even if it's an object so these are kind of pre-puppet exercises in a way and this idea of feeling the material and listening to the material again this has a kind of animist a fantastical sense to me of of how one approach, uh, approaches objects, listening to them. What do they want to say? Not me, what, what, what do they want to say? And I feel, I feel very often with puppetry that what I am is a kind of battery. I'm just, the, the, the puppet is there, you know, certainly you'll see puppets behind me, the characters are there in the puppets. When, um, you know, good puppet makers make, make puppets the characters there and me as a puppeteer I'm <clears throat> I'm just a battery I'm just a facilitator to allow that character out this is also true with um objects so I think that the um puppetry sort of by its very nature is is kind of fantastical it's fantastical for the puppeteer because we're bringing something to life and we're having this um mindset that everything can be alive that it, we're moving into a different space a different uh, moving into an otherness that isn't completely human um and also for the audience so um again that's been spoken about a bit today that the, the audience kind of come in with a with a, a magic if in, in any theater you go to there's this thing called the willing suspension of disbelief in puppetry, it's particularly true because you're willingly believing that an object is is alive. Um, and one of the shows I, I was very lucky to be involved in about 20 years ago now um, at The Little Angel, which was an adult show, um, which was by a, a director called Hank Schutt, who actually was an opera director and he'd come in to do puppets because he just intrigued by it and he brought this wonderful visual imagery and we did a show uh, a version of the bloody chamber um in his house it was moving house it was in um it was, it was in london it was it was a uh, an old one of those old kind of victorian houses and uh as because he was moving we could screw lighting into walls and things and the whole house became the bloody chamber and the audience were brought in by Hank it was in Archway actually London so it had that kind of quite quite weird then I noticed it's been done up actually but then it was very kind of cars and very old sort of London and um, the audience were brought in I think downstairs and then they were it was like a promenade and they kept going up stairs and then into the kitchen and then down and up again so they became very confused because all the um windows were blocked out so the house itself became the, the bloody chamber and there was me and sarah wright who's um daughter of uh, lindy wright from the little angel and uh, were the puppeteers and the audience were in that suspension of disbelief just in the house. And then we were using objects because Hank loved working with kind of objects. And there was a sort of a sensuality. I remember one, one point with the sensuality of the puppets where the audience was split in two between women came into me as the, the blue, blue beard and the men came into Sarah, who was the one of the girls and her puppet was sort of bathing in a little um, kitchen tub like one of those metal yellow metal kitchen tubs very sensual and my puppet was putting I was putting gloves on for the puppet and he was sort of very sensually uh, moving around and uh, there was a real yeah kind of sensuality to that in there and that was one of those moments of real connection of audience and puppeteer of really believing the same thing one of the things I find interesting about puppetry actually is that it's one of the only forms I can think of that in a sense as a puppeteer you're almost seeing the same thing as an audience so 
it's almost like you can go into a trance and you're almost watching what's happening. You're allowing it to unfold and you're kind of watching it too. I'll get to that actually. I'm going to talk about punch and there's something very specific about, about that. Um, so um, going along with this sort of idea of things being magical and that anything can be animated, as a director, one of the things that I love to do is not only have where the set is for the puppet to be animated, but you get scene changes. And I love to animate scene changes so that you, you stage manage them so that in front of the audience's eyes, the set changes without them realizing and suddenly there's a new scene comes out. Um, the, the movement is choreographed and, and beautiful. And my feeling with that is it's like kind of how I view magic to be, which is that there's a, well, I refer to it as a quantum soup of possibility. That's how I view my kind of magical ideas. And that out of that quantum soup of possibility, material reality kind of manifests. And I quite like that idea that, that by having set moving and suddenly whoosh, new set arrives and you're into another scene that you have that feeling of magic just appearing in front of you. Um, one of the things I was also struck by, actually, something I wanted, wanted to talk about, and, and again, you know, both uh, Todd and uh, Wendy and Brian talked about this. When I first started puppetry, which is in the 1990s, the puppeteer was always hidden, just about always hidden. That was just the traditional thing you assume the puppeteer wasn't going to be seen, which is what Brian was talking about with, uh, I think he was talking about the one of the puppets, I think it was Skepsis or something that was designed as a punch booth that you had the hand up here, but that it was designed to cover the puppeteer. And Todd's talked about, you know, now they use green screen and you can get rid of the puppeteer digitally. When I started, it was all, the puppeteer was hidden either behind a booth, so behind a, a playboard there and this was blacked out um and it, if you were doing tabletop puppetry very often you'd actually have black hoods on to try and not be the the scene by the audience and that started to change a bit that we started to experiment a bit more with bringing the puppeteer on and having a scene puppeteer to, to which now that's quite normal that's kind of what happens and uh, there's been sometimes when I've taught glove puppetry which does tend to yeah boom racker exactly uh, that when I teach glove puppetry uh, at Curious School that some of the puppeteers there are like what do you mean you, you can do puppetry without being seen and suddenly the pup puppet becomes really um, centre stage and I find it takes on a different life um, when when it's just a puppet and you can't see the puppeteer I think you go into even more of a sense of this magical reality, this suspension of disbelief and even more magical worlds are created. But there's something very interesting about seeing the puppeteer, either in relation to the puppet, so actually relating to a puppet, obviously, or seeing the puppeteer in that kind of, what we sort of refer to as a kind of puppeteer uh, state, where as an audience, you see the whole, and you see the puppeteer, but because of their focus, it focuses you even more on the puppet. So the, the human puppeteers start to become part of that shifting scenery, kind of what I was talking about with shifting set, that there's something also very magical about that. And almost kind of archetypical that you have these, these gods in a way, or, or spirits kind of looking over. Um, and of course, it depends on the show, whether you, that's what you want to go for, what costumes the puppeteers have on to give that background and how much you want them to be seen. Um, so the other thing that, that I find fascinating with puppets is how they, to my mind, they are both puppets human like we try and make them as human as possible todd was talking about the grounding and the the physics that go into puppets that you need that but they also have um they're also puppets 
they're also they are you know, objects that can, can do stuff so, so i'm just going to show another little uh, scene to show you some of this um, i'm going to set up the other camera so bear with me a couple of seconds i just got to move that and set that up Let's see if i can get that there okay that way. There it is. okay so this is a little uh play uh board that i've set up for this so i'll make sure the camera's the right angle so you can see everything there you go um during this improvisation the bits of the uh play board may fall apart don't worry about that it's just set up for this demonstration so i'm just going to show you what i mean the little scene to kind of show you what i mean about this way that puppets can change from human to uh puppet so stable okay change that, that back there we go so uh yeah i hope that that had, i'll just talk through that that little scene uh, thank you for that people clapping there. so this is what i mean by like a puppet is human so he comes on walking with gravity looks around and then an emotion can allow a puppet to fly through space can do jumps that that you know we saw um Todd's stuntman having to do, having to be pulled by string. A puppet can jump, if you think of a playboard, it'll like jump right the way across, can go up, can go down, can climb all over, and then come back to being human again. And I love this, this transition between human and puppet. It, you know, again, fantastical, these, these transformations that happen. And I think that's, you know, that's something that's at the very heart of puppetry is transformation. Um, it's that, that same basic thing of the basic breath, the basic transformation of a piece of cloth into some uh, something that we as an audience start to believe in and can see em emotions in and, and read, you know, we, we, we automatically read stories into things. Now that um, puppet I used there, or this puppet, I'll show it again. This is a, a puppet. This I don't make puppets myself, um, with the exception of one set, which I'll, I'll show you. These were made by Lindy Wright from Little Angel, and they're just beautiful. This is a set that she uh, made for me, from a set that she made for me. This is a pantaloni, Signor Pantaloni. And um, I have a set of Commedia puppets. And who made the puppet? Is that, so that was... Um, Lindy Wright, uh, who's the founder, co-founder of the Little Angel uh, Theatre. I'm sort of seeing comments that come up, so I'm replying a little bit. Every now and then I'll suddenly go, oh yeah, that. Um, yeah, so those Commedia puppets. Now I, I started out in, in Commedia and I find for me, the glove puppets that I like working with are Commedia. So I'll just talk a little bit about Commedia because I'm then gonna talk about Punch, because Punch, Mr. Punch, 
uh, comes from the Commedia tradition. So Commedia dell'arte was an Italian theater tradition that developed in the kind of 1500s, 1600s, kind of early Renaissance in Italy. And it was a mix of kind of courtly theater with street uh, minstrels and it used masks. So one of the big things about Commedia was that it used masks. It was very popular kind of form of theater, very often performed out of doors. It spread throughout Europe. It was contemporaneous with uh, Shakespeare, the texts written by whoever it was, Shakespeare, um, and has actually kind of, the only theater form that's actually carried on, like Shakespeare's carried on, Commedia has also carried on. It's, it's um, an influence on um, a Comédie Francaise, so Molière. Um, it spread throughout Europe. Then it went into uh, Brecht, was influenced by Meerholt, who was sort of contemporaneous with Stanislavski, was very influenced by Commedia. Um, Dario Fo, massively influenced by Commedia. Uh, Lecoq, who kind of started the whole physical theatre movement again, the mime school in France, massively influenced by Commedia. Uh, and Commedia had these like stock characters. Uh, so there was Mr. Pantaloni, uh, literal translation, Mr. Trousers, uh, because in Italian uh, Renaissance, sort of around Venice, trousers, the, the fact of wearing trousers was meant you were well off. Um, and then um, it had Zanni servant types, which were immigrants that came into the towns looking for work. Uh, there were Spanish Capitanos who were these braggartly sorts. I've actually got a Capitano mask here. There's some long noses that they have and they are often Spanish braggartly. They come into town, they womanize, they drink, they gamble, they create absolute chaos. Um, you have lovers, enamorati, uh, lovers in there, and uh, pantaloni, and uh, doctore. So there's all these types, and one of the zani types was uh, a character called Polcinello. And Polcinello is, this is a polch mask, hooked nose, very often had a hooked back. Yeah, punch. Now, Porcinello, the Commedia character, was um, born from an egg, it's in, from Naples. And the story goes that Porcinello was born from an egg and came out. And he was a weird character. He's, he's quite mean in many ways. He's quite dark. He has a slapstick. He's very kind of anarchic. And uh, can you show us in the mask, Harrod? Oh, Terry, what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. Yes. <laughs> hey, Terry, yes, I am. I am <sighs> very anarchic, like sea flies suffer. <laughs> I pull their wings off, watch them walk around. <laughs> Go and create some mischief. Ah. Okay, that's um, that's uh, Porcinello. So Porcinello. Now I think what happened is the, the, the comedia characters were turned into uh, marionette characters, it seems, and they visited London. The first sighting of Punch in in England, first mention of it. Of a Mr. Punch is by Samuel Pepys in May uh, 1662 in Covent Garden. And that is where, like, Mr. Punch, that's his birthday, that's where we see his birthday. And Mr. Punch, I think what happened was there used to be massive fairs like Bartholomew Fair and people coming in, these big marionette companies like circuses could draw in a crowd and there'd probably be. Um, a booth out front with maybe some glove puppets encouraging people to come in to see the big show that'd be going on. And at some point that became not commercially viable. And as with all popular entertainment, all popular street stuff, it always adapts to the, to the environment. 
always that yeah like um johnson's bartholomew fair uh, always adapts to the environment and so what happened was suddenly it wasn't economically viable to have these big companies but the person in that booth trying to get people on is like that's one person what what character seemed to stand out for the british polchinello now i think punch so when i said i don't i don't make puppets i don't with one exception i've made my pump punch show because i believe that's something that's uh, that's important to do i think you know you have to make your own punch show now mr punch I'll tell you, Mr. Punch, I'm telling him about you. <laughs> okay, Mr. Punch. Just uh, just stay down there for a minute. So so Mr. Punch, I think, is you know, has an element of the crooked nose, the hunchback, but was a mix of our English kind of court jesters, and he is a fool. He's an English fool. Um I just want to quickly sort of look through, uh, just introduce you quickly to the uh, characters of uh, Punch. So you've got Punch here, obviously. Then there's Judy. So that's Punch and Judy. So that's Judy's wife. Uh, there's always a crocodile who wants to eat sausages. Where did the crocodile come in? I don't know. I think in the Victorian era. So what happens in Punch is that very often, there's almost certainly this season, there'll be a Putin puppet. And the last season, there would have been a Johnson puppet and puppets with COVID. There's new things that come into an old formula and uh, some of them just stick. And I think the crocodile stuck. There is the hangman who tries to hung, hang punch uh, and doesn't succeed. Actually ends up getting hung himself, uh, of course. There's the uh, policeman here. Ooh. There he is, Mr. PC Percy Blood. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> okay, and <laughs> oh, you got a moth in you, Mr. Devil. I am <laughs> the devil. <laughs> I am Beelzebub. I am Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Okay, so you have the devil. Uh, I'm realizing I'm going to there. And he fell over. Um, so those are the puppets in basic puppets in Mr. Punch. There's all sorts of different turns. Now, several things. I think, first of all, the reason that what happens is the slapstick. You have Punch on your right hand. You have a character come up. There's an interaction. The best way to get a puppet off, if you want to keep this puppet on, is to knock them down, bring another puppet on knock them down, bring another puppet on. So Mr. Punch became the the main puppet in it and just knocked everybody off. So you have this uh, slapstick comedy that comes out of Comedia. You have different turns. And this, this is the easiest way to do it. But I think there's something deeper in Punch, personally. I think Mr. Punch is the archetype of anarchy. He's an anarchic fool. And the structure of the show is such that the first thing that he does is to completely reject domestic, uh, kind of domestic having to do something. Now in my show, I don't have any domestic violence because uh, I think the show ad adapts. But even with that, he rejects, you know, the idea of, of being told what to do. He just refuses to do in the domestic setting. And then with the policeman, and there's often a beadle who, 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 who um, I don't have yet in my show, but there's a beadle who, who's a judge who, who sentences punch to death and the hangman. They represent societal pressure for you have to conform. And punch with his slapstick um, just gets rid of that. Now the slapstick's actually a, is a thought to come from 
sort of Commedia is this sort of rod of Hermes. It's like a magical stick. It's a wand. It's a magical wand. So he basically just slaps that away. And then you get, yeah, it really is a slap stick. It actually is a slap stick. It makes a, a, a slap, a slapping sound. Uh, it's got two bits of wood that slap together. So it sounds big, but you don't have to hit too hard. Uh, and then you get the the devil and sometimes a ghost. And again, punch just um, just knocks them out. So there's an ex existential sort of pressure on punch. And being anarchy, he just literally refuses all of all of any kind of conformity. So I think there's that element to punch, which I think is often not appreciated in in. Uh, in it in the show that there's something quite deep and speaks quite deep to our freedoms and to play and to stupidity now i also have i'm uh i i am studying uh, for a phd at exeter university and my topic is the esoteric art of the fool is this fooling what is a fool there's modern fooling which is about speaking truth to power and one of the things in the training for fooling that, that we look at is these different areas of the stage. And I think punch really has that as well. So you've got this an anarchic timeline or, or storyline going on there. And there's also a depth in terms of the what's happening in there. So the first, there's three areas of the stage in fooling. The first one is talking to an audience like I am with you now. This is the fourth stage. This is what happened in theatre before the fourth wall came down in the sort of Victorian age. They went, no, don't ignore the audience, just we'll carry on here and uh, we'll be very, very um, emotional and dramatic, but let's pretend the audience isn't there. Fourth wall. So it used to be, you know, theatre was out on the streets and you were talking to people and attracting them and then you bring them into your play, which is the, um, that's the bit which we have in most theatre now with the fourth wall. Obviously this is breaking down with modern theatre, but you have this play that goes on between the characters. So in Commedia, you have this front stage in uh, Punch talking to the audience, talking to the children, uh, getting them excited, banter back and forward, and then the interaction between characters. And in Fooling, there's this third area, which is a bit I'm really interested in, which is called the uh, kind of like the archetypal world. And in the uh, study that I've done with kind of masterful Jonathan Kay, uh, it's it's the sort of area that contains everything that's secret, secret, sacred, scarred or scared in us all. That's how we, we get into the archetypal realm. Now I think in Commedia that archetypal realm is contained in the masks. So you have the four stage where characters will particularly, um, Harlequin is often talking to the audience or Columbina is talking direct to the audience at the front of the stage. And then the main, part of the stage which is um, where the play goes on, where the characters are in their own world. And then there is this other world which is the archetypal. So in Commedia, I think that comes through in the masks. It's a fantastical, it's, it's metaphysical, I think. And in Punch, that inner part of the booth, I think that's where I am as the Punch professor with my two puppets there, where I am is the archetypal world. And in a Punch booth on the seasides of uh, Britain or is pretty small it's about three foot by three foot there's a curtain down here that I can see through and I was talking about that kind of veil that I'm watching puppets do stuff and I'm watching them and in this veil in this darkened space in Plato's cave I like to think of it that's the archetypal world and I'm the battery allowing that to come through uh, no, just sort of before I finish, a, a little anecdote about that. There was, um, when I first started doing Punch, Punch is chaotic as a show, absolute chaos. It's very improvised. There's a structure there, but every time I put puppets on, they something happens, an interaction with the audience, something changes. The, the structure's the same, but the actual performance is always very specific to that audience and to that time. And when I first started doing it the first season, I, I had chaos in the booth. The booth would fall down, the, the playboard would fall down. I couldn't get puppets on, I'd lose slapsticks. I'd swallow my swazzle. I would, it was just chaos. It was like anarchy of punch was just in the booth. Going, <laughs> and Terry actually suggested 
to me that what I need to do is uh, kind of say a, a little prayer to the, the, to the chaos and to punch. And um, I did, and I sort of had a talk with it saying, look, punch, you know, th it's great that there's this anarchy here, but can we not have that out on the play board? That's where it's meant to be. It's meant to be there, playing with the children. Anarchy with, you know, letting the children enjoy the, the stupidity of it. Let's not have it in the booth. And actually, touch wood, that when I go back to punch, more or less since then, it's it's been out on the play board rather than in the booth. Occasionally it, it comes in, but that that channeling of that chaotic, almost chthonic kind of energy, that's that's partly the my job and when it's out there and responding to to children um yeah and i um yes yeah, just to, just to, to finish off then so that anecdote the, the other thing that i'd say is I, I was very very lucky last year um to be probably the first person to perform in the whole country after covid because a punch show is a one-person show it's outdoors is literally the only stuff that could happen sort of during these these times um and there was something magical about grandparents bringing their grandchildren to watch a show which they grandchildren were seeing for the first time grandchildren uh, grandparents had had a memory of from 70 years or whatever ago but they were connecting through this point in, in time through this show that just there's something about it. It survived like Commedia survived and Shakespeare has survived because it's archetypal, because there's something very deep in it that connects to our psyche, I think. Um, so, yeah, um, and I think I will end there and end with, as everything uh, does with theatre is, um, is ephemeral. All these, spirits that play you know, like puck puck says and ariel says you know if we spirits have offended think but this and all is mended i can't remember the rest of that quote but we have just sort of played here and uh, we're just spirits theater is ephemeral unlike uh, film it disappears that little booth in punch that's about five foot up that has all that energy in it when children are watching it once the booth is dismantled it just becomes a bit of air I think that's quite magical. Okay, um, thank you all for listening and um, I'll, I'll finish my talk there. Thank you so much, Howard. That was absolutely spectacular. Uh, we never expected to have you performing for us on stage right here on our screens. That was absolutely wonderful to see and to hear. Uh, I haven't had a swizzle for so long. It's absolutely fantastic to hear. Magnificent. Uh, I loved loved your Commedia dell'arte performance as well. Thank you, Terry, for forcing him into it. <laughs> uh, so uh, we have some questions. And uh, once you've taken a, a swig or two to yeah, yeah. and uh, sort of, uh, I'll uh, I'll have a look at at, at some of them and, and see what um, uh, see what we've got for you. Um, so uh, I've got the first one is from Danica. Uh, who's just about to embark on a, 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 a writing about uh, about uh, about um, his dark materials? Uh, so I'm just having a look at here. Um, I'm just wondering. Sorry, I'm actually wondering whether I'm getting these questions That's from from the previous one. I'll, I'll just I'll just have a quick look at the. Um, no, it is. It, it's for you. They're definitely for you. So uh, here we are. Okay. Uh, so Danica asks, when you as an expert look at your puppets. How lifelike and realistic do you actually want them to be? And where would you put the line between willing suspension of disbelief and actually turning this into belief in the audience? Mm. I think it depends on what show you're doing. So as I started with objects, you know, an object is an object. If I did a shoe, I could find the character of a shoe and it might become a policeman. And I could get the audience to believe it but it wouldn't be the same level of belief, I think, as if I'm using like some of Lindy's puppets, which are so beautiful, or Wendy's, you know, they just have a, they already are, are shaping into something. So a lot of it depends on the design of the show. What's the show doing? You, you, you'll get belief in an audience anyway. Um, I, I 
remember a review from the Bluebeard show that went on to stage of me. It was a lump of wood, and I think it was a, in the Guardian saying that somehow I made a lump of wood sexy or something, which was a really nice kind of review. So it's possible to kind of do do that uh, for the audience, but um, yeah, it very much depends on kind of what show you want to do. So I've worked like I carved my punch set because I knew it didn't have to be perfect, that punch, it was more an expression of self, but I can't make puppets. I can't decide a design. So if I was gonna do a show like that, I would go to a puppet maker mm -hmm. and they will bring a, a design out. And you know, when you work with good designs and good puppets with good mechanisms, it's fabulous. I mean, absolutely fabulous because they, they start to work themselves in some ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were absolutely, all of us, absolutely gobsmacked by what you did with your piece of William Morris uh, cloth there at the beginning. I, 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 you know, just giving it eyes, giving it legs, you know, it was an entire being by the time you'd finished with it. So I can, you know, in, in a way you've, you've kind of illustrated what you mean magnificently with, with that and with the masks and with the, with, with the characters that you've been in the course of your talk. Um, so Tamara uh, has a question. Uh, what would your advice be to someone like myself who's going into their master's degree in theatre and wants to create multimedia theatre which involves puppetry? And are there any practitioners in puppetry theatre uh, who I could do more research into? Oh, gosh, yes. Um, my advice would be, well, if, you, if, you, if you're wanting to go into pra like pra practice research or practice in your MA, uh, if your course doesn't do puppetry, which it might do. There are courses you can do to, like the Little Angel runs adult puppetry courses. I don't know where she's based. The Curious School in England does. So yes, finding someone who, who can, uh, Rini Baker is a wonderful person to work with. Uh, I knew her right back in my Norwich Puppet Theatre days and she really goes into great detail into this basics of puppetry. Um, yeah, it's to find somewhere to, to start exploring them, but also you can explore it yourself. I mean, the exercise that I gave you, you can look at. Um, and start to think of puppets, not just as, I'm just thinking multimedia for me, that that sounds kind of performance arty. That makes me feel, you get ahead, not necessarily a whole body and see what you can do to animate that and make that have some life. An object maybe, or and then, you know, how does how does that interrelate with the other parts of the multimedia? Um, there's a lot of, you know, multimedia and puppets are are starting to be to be a, a thing now because they all have different, you know, film puppets, acting, movement all have different um, expressions. Uh, so, yeah, I'd say go and, uh, and in terms of practitioners of multimedia puppetry, um, I'm trying to think there is someone that I can't remember, uh, Philippe Jonti, I think. Uh, is someone you should look at. He's he's a French uh, puppeteer who does very big um, puppetry things. Maybe look at Mum and Chance as well. These are probably very old. You know, the, I'm I'm older than the young generation, so I kind of have my own references. But um, and there's some good shadow puppet companies as well now. Um, uh, is it Electric Moth? I don't think that's the name down here. Electric. I think it's. I think it's something like Electric Moth, they do shadow, shadow puppetry. Yeah, those are those would be some places to look You're at. You're making uh, multimedia puppetry sound very much like that palette that uh, uh, Brian and Todd have both mentioned. Uh, you know, the sort of multiple different ways that you can bring things to life kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, the interchange between them is great. But we've got a question from CK uh, who asks if you've ever performed in Comedia dell'arte without puppets, which I know you have. Uh, yeah. And um, if so, what's your favorite character from Comedia to perform? Oh, character to perform or actual yeah. character. So oh, my favorite, yeah, the character that I always ended up performing mostly was uh, Signor Pantaloni. <laughs> I performed, our company kind of mixed Comedia with kind of British humor. So we were, in France, we were kind of known as sort of Comedia straight Monty Python sort of thing. And my, I, I played, Pantaloni in several different ways. One of them in our version of Faustus was this doddering old man who was always a fraction of a second behind all conversations. So something would ask a question over there. And just as the scene moved over there, he'd go, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> he'd just be constantly confused. Um, 
I've played a couple of Capitanos. I played a, I, well, actually one of my favorite was playing uh, Sheriff of Nottingham as a captain. And that was wonderful. A cap, a braggartly sheriff with these two idiot henchmen, you know, typical, you know, the, the villain having the people that couldn't make a plan work together. So yeah, those, those were the ones I kind of prefer to play. I love it that you were uh, you were Pantaloni and uh, you've given us a, demon- a, a little demonstration uh, in, in, in tiny puppet form. So uh, yeah. uh, we're very satisfied with that. Um, uh, so um, just looking through a few others. Uh, um, oh, yeah. Um, Ellen has an interesting question. Can you elaborate on the terminology or on the phrase punch professor? Ah, okay, yeah. So I don't know where this came from, but pe- people that do Punch and Judy became known as professors. That that they self, I mean, a self um, adopted title. There's no, you know, professors are normally at universities, um, and they I think they're, they're when you get tenure, you kind of become professor. And I think it's a, just a kind of like a like Professor, so I'm Professor Gayton when I do my Punch and Judy and all Professor, all Punch and Judy people are Professor so-and-so, Professor so-and-so. And I think it's just a kind of like ridiculous, ridiculous, it's so ridiculous because what you're doing is sort of slapping about with with um, bits of wood in your hand. Um, so I think that's probably where it came from. And I can't, I, de- I haven't actually looked into the etymology of it, but I, I suspect it's just one person thought, we should be respected. <laughs> and let's make ourselves respected. And what is lovely is I, because I'm at university doing a PhD, and there are people that now I'm Punch and Judy, and they refer to me as professor. So in a university context, I'm like, that's really <laughs> kind of like weird because it's like, like on that title. <laughs> I, that's, I think that sounds like a, a, a really good answer. Um, I, I'm actually remembering that uh, um, the the, uh, the Celtic Football Club in um, in Glasgow was quite famous for sending out its players to different places to teach football, and they were known as professors as well. Uh, so this was in the sort of 19th, early 20th century. So uh, yeah, that, that that seems to me like a, a great response. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Halo, who I, I think is a practitioner, um, asks, do you have any advice for relating to or through puppets in a walkabout environment? Oh, yeah, I haven't done much of that in puppets. I've done quite a lot in masks, mm-hmm. but sometimes very often that is uh, the case that you would have a, in a sense, a sort of puppet mask. I think it, it's it, it's like with everything that you... you what I tend to do with walkabouts is you find the, a few gags, a few little routines that work that you can play, that you know are going to kind of work. Mm-hmm. And you kind of c- come into an area, you do that, and then you take the uh, puppet or the, the mask off because you don't want to stay around too long, partly because people start then pulling on you and blah, blah, blah. So you want to come in and depending also whether you've got one person or two, what we've done uh, when we have our obios here in, in May, very often with a one of those big mask puppets you'll have a kind of caller someone who's helping to keep make sure that people aren't sort of um dis- distracting them. and what we we found with masks when we were doing parades is that our job in as comedia masks was to go and do little bits of interaction with the crowd like a big parade would be going through and we'd be going off and creating a little bit of energy here and a little bit there but just just like boom 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 you know like that and i think that if it's kind of walkabout, that's almost what you want is some little in- interaction that's just, you know, takes a little bit of minute or so, makes people laugh, makes them think, and then you move on somewhere else and you develop a few little kind of, what we call that scene in comedia, little s- things that you can do, little scenes that you know that you're doing. And in between that, you're kind of improvising. You're finding what does that puppet sound like? How does it, is it you know, if it's an emu, is it pecking at grass on the way to the next uh, thing, for example? I love that description of sort of, uh, uh, it was sort of spreading the performance out and sort of heading it, sending it off in different parts of space kind of thing. Uh, that's, that's, that sounds really powerful. I'd love to see it at work, actually. Um, we've got, um, we're, we're gradually getting to the end, I think. Um, but I'd like to ask one more question, which I thought was a good one, which is from Maggie. Uh, and it's, um, as an actor, how big a shift is it to confine your physical movement largely it's your hands and arms when you're doing puppetry. Is it difficult to go between full body acting and puppetry in terms of instincts and intuition? I personally don't find it difficult, but I know 
from working at the doing auditions for puppeteers that very often you get actors who audition and they find it very difficult mm -hmm. because why on earth when you've been trained to get people looking at you would you want the audience to look at stupid face on here i mean look at the hand, <laughs> hand. Uh, however when you get actors that can do that that our understanding of it, the acting skills can be brilliant. And there's some, there's a lot of play that can be had. I was talking before about, you know, with when the actors, when you see the actor of how much do you give the puppet? How much do you, are you giving um, presence to the puppet and how much are you taking yourself? And that movement between the two. So when I did the sort of demonstration there, I was giving it all to the puppet, but that movement between is an interesting dynamic, I think. And certainly a lot of sort of modern puppetry is, is looking at that a bit more. It's like, well, it doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be between and why not shift between? And, mm -hmm. and I think um, certainly, you know, I think using masks as well as puppets helps me because mm -hmm. I'm used to embodying the mask. Mm -hmm. And I also, I don't, I obviously, worked in masks because I didn't particularly want people to see me. So it wasn't that difficult for me to kind of get people to see the puppet. I loved what you were saying earlier about the interaction or the, the, the shift uh, that takes place within the puppet itself between the human and the puppet. Mm. So the things a puppet can do only are the things yeah. that are clearly human. Uh, uh, and you, you're, you're describing in terms of all these shifts at the moment. And uh, that's absolutely fascinating. It's not something that I've thought about at all. I should say, um, I mean, right away that this has been an absolutely amazing session. And one of the things that the real joy for me is, is hearing from uh, a performer and uh, and actually sort of seeing you perform and getting a sense uh, through what you've been saying of, uh, of what's happening when you perform. It was so important that we have that uh, sort of as part of the day, because without having it, you're not understanding puppets performances and, uh, and and the way that, that that the puppets work so i just like to thank you so warmly for an absolutely spectacular show uh, in, in in every kind of way um thank you and uh, and everybody um who would like to please come along to our final panel which is going to be at uh, at 4 30 but in the meantime please put your hands together one more time for the wonderful howard gayton thank you very much Thank you. Pleasure.